Welcome to the High Bar, your weekly watering hole for lighthearted conversation with people who care about culture that matters. I am Warren Etheridge, your host and barkeep. I promise never to cut anyone off while encouraging all to think responsibly. Today, join me and my special guest, best-selling author Garth Stein, as we raise a toast and raise the bar for literacy. The question used to be, why can't Johnny read? But that presents it as a singular problem. However, illiteracy is growing at alarming rates. And today, to raise the bar for literacy is the fabulous author of The Art of Racing in the Rain, Garth Stein. Welcome. Good to see you, Warren. <laughs> nice to see you, sir. Well, <laughs> it, it, it really is an issue. I know that I was a teacher in an alternative high school mm -hmm. back on the East Coast for a number of years. And one of the reasons I took my leave at that job was <laughs> that at some point, I was essentially asked to pass somebody, to graduate a student, who in essence could neither read nor write. Uh, and it seems like the system is failing kids, adults, everywhere. What, what's happened? <laughs> I mean, I, it's a good question. I mean, it's something that's it's probably a little bit bigger than I uh, have a good grasp on in terms of uh, educational theories and, and so forth. Um, you know, what the way we take a look at, at uh, literacy through um, our group, which is called Seattle Seven Writers, uh, which is a, a kind of an affiliation of uh, professional writers in the Seattle area, and we raise money for literacy programs. Um, you know, we're all about the passion of, of reading and the passion of writing, and and sharing that our enthusiasm for it and trying to make it infectious. At the same time, we try and raise money to support literacy programs who can target certain populations that maybe are having. Uh, difficulties because of what understaffing, because of um, uh, different problems that occur with uh, children these days uh, in terms of learning disabilities and so forth. Uh, teachers need to be trained um, in how to teach writing and reading in a very effective way and things like that. So our job is not necessarily to um, solve the problem, but to support uh, the, the people who can solve the problem. You should do it through television because people can understand that. <laughs> yeah, I guess. I mean, part of the it was interesting when you know when I knew I was coming in to talk to you about this. I was thinking, what, what is what is it about reading that I love so much? And for me, it's it's the active uh, nature of it. And uh, when I look at my own kids, and many of them I have running around my house. Um, many of them. How, how many do you have? They're everywhere. Exactly. Right? It seems like you, know, you can't you can't throw a book without hitting one of them. Um, the, there's a, it, it's easy to fall into the passive mode of flip on the TV and watch a soccer game or you know, fall into a computer game, or especially in the summertime when you're not being stimulated necessarily by, by school. Right. Um, and you know, there's certainly, I love movies. I, look, I watch some TV, you know, right. uh, there's a place for that. But it is definitely pass, a passive form. Right. You're looking at someone else's image and you're taking it in and you're interpreting it. And you can take that to a very high level, of course, as you do. Right. But you also can kind of veg out. And with a book, you, you can't veg out. You have to create the picture in your mind. And so I think that stimulus really generates a creativity among kids. And that's why, I, you know, we at the Seattle 7 are very much for uh, promoting literacy whenever we can. Well, that sounds sane and practical All right. and, and wonderful. Let's have a drink. But there we go. <laughs> Good man. That, that promotes literacy right there. The letters blend together. It's fantastic. <laughs> but, but let's talk about literacy itself because, you know, in doing research for the show, everybody has a, a different definition of it. And if we talk about raising the bar, right now it seems the bar for literacy has been set to like a, a limbo level or something mm -hmm. like that. How do you define literacy? Well, I don't know. I mean, I was listening to a guy on the radio last week um, talking about uh, some economic issues and talking about how education was the way out of these major economic movements in our history. Uh, the depression of 1870s, uh, the Great Depression, and now he was talking about the Great Recession. I love that term. The Great, Re I mean, I hate the term, but it's got a ring to it, right? Um, and the idea of changing the educational, raising the educational bar to uh, to energize and to educate the populace to a point that now is is deemed more necessary. So with industrialization, we had to 
make a literate populace that could um, read instruction manuals to work on the, the, the supply, the assembly line, right? Yeah. And in the 40s and 50s, getting out of the, the Great Depression after World War II, we needed to then educate with the GI Bill and educate the population to do, you know, be doctors and be more technical. And so then suddenly high, high school education w kicked in that was mandatory to get a high school education as opposed to, say, sixth or seventh grade. Mm. So now, how do, what do we need now? And how do we educate the population now? What, what new way do we have to look at it? And I, I think you're right. You know, this idea of functional literacy is um, it's, it's dismaying. Uh, but then we grew up in sort of a, in a time of, you know, the heyday for education, you know, I guess, the 60s and the 70s. Right. There was plenty of money to spend on schools. The, the schools were not overpopulated. Um, and, uh, you know, there are other issues probably that, that, that come into play there. Um, right, but we've had different booms, economic booms, that have not actually invested in education whatsoever. We had the Internet boom, and you don't see a lot of money going into education at that time. Uh, oh, point taken. <laughs> but I guess uh, the question is maybe there's a, there's a skepticism right now that the educational system can handle it. I mean, I think that's what we're facing right now is this idea of do we do charter schools, do we do public schools, do we do private schools, how do we best educate and how do we best uh, allocate those funds. And frankly, I think there's a lot of skepticism on the part of the people who are holding the purse strings that it can, that it can, the bureaucracy of public education can maintain itself. And I'm saying that as a kid who came through the public school system here in Seattle, I mean, it was, it was fine, it was good, it worked for me, uh, but there are, things change. and. One of the problems that we have is we're, we're very reactionary in our approach to education. And we, we don't try to blaze new trails. We say, well, it worked, so let's keep it working until it the wheels fall off. Well, when the wheels fall off, then we're in big trouble already. Right. So we need to anticipate the lug nuts coming loose right. and, and see what we can do to try and to raise the high bar. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, just, just work it in there. Right? Nice. Well, the lug nuts are loose, though. I mean, clearly they are loose. Yeah. I mean, you know, it used to be that the New York Times, this always horrified me when I was in school, they said it was written at a seventh grade level, but clearly it's written at a, a level lower than that now. And, and everything is. USA Today may as well, you know, be a paint by numbers sort of exercise. You know, there, it's true. No offense, USA Today readers. I know. You're going to so. <laughs> I don't think they're watching the your show. Review is, <laughs> your review is out the window. And by the way, <laughs> Janet Maslin is right now writing up her hate review. <laughs> Damn her. Jonathan Franzen, good. Warren Etheridge, no, not, not so good. good no. um, you know, I don't know. It's a real interesting question, I think. It's very layered because people read for different reasons. Um, uh, you know, there's this whole talk in the, in the, among writers about e-books and the future of the, written, the printed word and the future of, of literature in that way. And I, I think that, that there's a place for everything and that different people read in different ways. And so, you know, somebody who's more interested in, say, genre fiction is, you know, they buy, read two books a week that's who the Kindle is for. But the people, the traditionalists, who, who are gonna read you know, Freedom by Jonathan Franzen are likely gonna wanna have that tactile, that tactile feeling. So I don't know, I mean, it's a, we're, we're kinda spraying um, our, our, our thoughts here because it's, I'm not sure I'm, I'm um, uh, good enough to be able to answer the question about <laughs> how to solve literacy. <laughs> But I mean, functional literacy, I mean, you know, it's, it's, functional literacy, I guess, is not putting an X as your signature and being able to write your name and, and, you know, read the most basic information out there. But, but literacy really, to me, embodies something more than that. It's not just about getting by, it's about getting enrichment. I uh, think so, and, and expressing your feelings, and mm -hmm. expressing your feelings in a way that is, you know, re reflects on what you, you know, the reality of what you're, you're going through. I mean, th which is why we support programs such as 826 Seattle, um, uh, uh, powerful schools, writers in the schools, uh, places where they're putting writers, professional writers in to work with kids, uh, to energize the kids, not just say, hey, this is drudgery and, and it's, you gotta do it because you gotta fill out the workbook on page 32, but to say, what can we discover in this process that allows you to, um, you know, portray yourself to your friends and family in a way that is provocative? And I've taught plenty. Of t I've taught in a lot of schools and at a lot of different grade levels. And when you can get to these kids, and it kind of a light goes off, a light switch goes off, where they say, "Wow, 
that really works for me. I want to do it again. I was in one class um, at Hawthorne Elementary School, and we were writing some short some short stories. We were doing a thing on um, legends, so because mm -hmm. it gives us a bit of mythology, gives us a bit of a structure that we can work with for these kids. I think they were fourth grade at the time, and this one kid was writing and writing and writing. And over five weeks that I was there, he wrote he wrote over twenty stories. When the assignment was to write one, you know, yeah. and and he just he couldn't he didn't know where it was coming from he just kept on how's this one how's this one I was boggled by it, but this is a kid who got really turned on by, by this process of the the energy of literature, and I think that's, if you can tap into that, and then it becomes self generating, you see then literacy is uh, it's not a passive thing then it's a, a child trying to seek out. You know, I want to read this book. I want to read the Harry Potter book. I want to read the the new uh, Mockingjay book because I'm excited about the book, not because it's being assigned to me. Well, that seems to be part of it is making it fun again and making it mm -hmm. sort of sexy again. I spent the last year teaching in my daughter's first grade class. Actually, for whatever reason, they allowed me to teach creative writing beyond the <laughs> curriculum. Yeah, because it was very standardized as to what they were going to do right. otherwise. And I went in there, and kids were really excited, and they're just six but they turn on same thing kids wanted to write like kids would come up with me it's like I wrote stuff over the weekend would you take a look yeah and I, I think there there are ways to get people but you have to make it make them passionate about it yeah uh, I totally agree and, and I think at that age I love teaching in the in the lower school uh, elementary school uh, grade levels because they'll actually do it yeah. you know there I, it's sometimes it's a when I teach adults they like they'll put down their pencil I'm not doing that I'm like <laughs> Why not? <laughs> it's dumb, you know. Like, but a, but a fourth grader won't say that. High right. school, they'll say that. Right. So there's just something bad that happens between fourth grade and eleventh grade. I don't know what it is. What do they call it? <laughs> Puberty. <laughs> and in fourth grade, you can take their ideas, and the the idea that I'm suing you later is is highly highly <laughs> unlikely. <laughs> you know, I make all my first graders sign a release form. <laughs> yeah. So good of Any, you. Anything that they write when I'm teaching is my property. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. There is this uh, horrifying stat uh, that always comes to mind, which is that the average American household buys less than one book per year. No way, really? Yeah, and, and I know that I'm throwing that number off <laughs> already by buying way too many. Yeah. Uh, so that's alarming to me, but maybe they're all going to the library. But then I, I was speaking to awesome. uh, Chuck Palahniuk, yeah. and he had a, a fascinating thing because he writes a lot. Right. And he said that his attitude is that he believes that his books may be the only book that somebody reads during the year. So he feels compelled to, to publish at least one per year. Well, I guess that shows something about Chuck Palahniuk. <laughs> He's giving back. He's giving to the people. Well, that's very generous of him. Thanks, Chuck. Thank you. <laughs> you, you don't feel that same, uh, same drive uh, to, uh, to produce? I mean, no, I don't know. I, uh, I, look, I mean, we all write for our own for own reasons. And if, if that's you – know, Chuck Palahniuk is a great writer. And I'm a big fan. Mm -hmm. So even though – Paul Constant did give him a pretty hard time for his last book, right. <laughs> In the Stranger. Um, you know, I, we all write for, for the reasons that we, we need to do it. Um, uh, I, I like telling stories, and uh, I, don't, um, I, I don't necessarily believe it's the only book people are going to read. In <laughs> fact, I would encourage them to read other books. Too. Not just your book, <laughs> not or, just or, or not just Chuck's books. I don't know. <laughs> My book over and over and over again, that, that would be the no exit of, of literature. <laughs> Well, let's talk about this uh, event you have coming up, because I think this is a fascinating mm -hmm. uh, way to draw attention. It's called The Novel Live, mm -hmm. and it is uh, one of the craziest stunt performance art pieces yes. I can imagine. Yes, I, uh, I'd like to take uh, full credit for coming up with this crazy idea, um, although it's not an original idea necessarily. It's sort of original to this. It's part of a, a month called Arts Crush, which is the month of October, this new program that um, uh, Theater Puget Sound has been spearheading called Arts Crush, and the second week of October is going to be the Literary Arts Week. And they said, they got a bunch of people in the literary community together and said, well, what could you do as a free program to bring people in and, and energize the reading and writing public? And people are like, we could have readings. Or we could teach <laughs> workshops. I'm like, you, in Seattle, re there's like 90 readings a day. I mean, it's like there's so many, re saying let's have readings doesn't really do anything. I said, we gotta do something much more exciting. Let's have a, novel reading marathon and it was like oh that sounds kind of neat and i was like wait 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 let's go even higher let's raise the bar even higher <laughs> let's do a novel writing marathon 